So, John, it's a great pleasure to, to have you back again um, uh, nine months later from when we were uh, meeting last year in August. Um, at that time, you actually came up at the start and opened the conference, and um, we'd just come out of lockdown. And some of the things you said to us were remarkably prescient. Um, you said that uh, this was going to be way worse than we kind of imagined at the time. Um, and you talked about the need for calm leadership and for clear messaging. Uh, and you said a few other things as well, which I'll probably come back to. But I was interested nine months on what, what your, your take is now in terms of what you've seen and how much is, is you, you've learned. Yeah, I mean, it, look, I wasn't here this morning, so I can't, uh, I can't comment on what the speakers said. I'm, I'm sure they were right, but I, I didn't hear it. So, um, But I guess what I would sort of say is, look, we are going through from a COVID perspective uh, the next phase, I think, which is essentially how do we exit the position we're currently in and get back to much greater normality. And the first part of that, I'd say, is actually we're going to have to change our mindset I think we're going to have to learn to live with COVID in the community, whether we like it or not. And the main reason for that is I am amazed how many people I run into that aren't going to take the vaccine. Um, Well-educated, thoughtful, good people, but they're not taking the vaccine. And I just say to them, well, don't you ever want to travel? You're going to have to have the vaccine to travel. Oh, well, no. Uh, aren't you worried if you catch it, it might kill you? Mm, no. Um, OK. Well, I mean, you start running out of questions. But, but the point is... Um, <laughs> You know, the truth of it is that, that if we get to a point where let's accept, you know, a decent number of people, 25% or whatever, don't take the vaccine, then at some point the government is going to have to say whether they like it or not that actually people, you know, who may well be vaccinated but may well be able to pass the vaccine on are going to be back operating as per normal in the community and assuming we're not going to have to stay in an MIQ facility after the rest of our lives. And on that basis there will be COVID back in the community. So I think the first thing we've got to say is get vaccinated. You know, like if you look at countries like Israel, they've been far more effective, I think, at getting that message out there. It's not really, I, I think people have to say, well, what is the reason they don't think they should get vaccinated? If you look at the research, um, it seems to be that people are concerned that the vaccine was created very quickly, and so they're, they don't trust it. And I think they've just got to go back to basics and say, well, look, as I understand it, um, the basis of the vaccine has some of the least roots back into the N1H1 vaccine that actually it's had a huge sample base because there's been so many people. So that's, that's one thing I think is we've got to get vaccinated. I think the second thing is we need greater urgency. You know, I hear the government, I'm not saying it's easy, I accept that New Zealand's a place that currently doesn't have COVID in the community so it's hard to, hard to argue. But actually realistically uh, what we know is when you see countries that are either vaccinated in a much greater form, or getting vaccinated quite rapidly, including clearly the United States and the UK, um, actually their economies are starting to bounce back, bounce back and we don't want to have moved from a position where we, it was a position of strength that we didn't have COVID to actually being left behind. So we've got to get on with it. Um, <clears throat> one of the areas that you talked about last time that uh, I'm keen to... Um, uh, raise again is the you talked about the need for investment into infrastructure and the you know the significant challenge that Auckland faces in terms of the investment that's required um, and you talked about the challenges that the council has with its revenue to debt ratios yep. and the limits and the caps in terms of of that that um, ability to invest um, I'm interested whether you know you you, you um, have further thoughts and, and what some of the options are in terms of investing and supporting the kind of investment, the urgent investment that, that we require. Yeah. I mean, look, I think the first thing I'd say is, you know, we moved to Auckland in 1988, and if I reflect on, you know, a, a period of time overseas, but largely, you know, three decades in Auckland, it continues to become year after year a better city to live in, in my view. And there are lots of reasons for that, but partly it's actually scale. Um, I personally like the fact it's a multicultural society in Auckland that a third of people weren't born in New Zealand. Um, I think it actually makes it a much more interesting, fun place to live in and, um, and a, a bit more of a, a city that actually has a global perspective. I think there's more things we can... I mean, if you look at and you say, well, what makes a good city... Um, firstly, it's you know you can actually do lots of fun things, and I think there's some simple things actually in Auckland that you could do to celebrate the diversity of Auckland. Uh, they actually don't cost any money, aka why don't we have a Chinatown in Auckland? 
I mean, you could argue, okay, look, there's plenty, of, I'm, not, I'm not an idiot, there's plenty of parts of Auckland that have great Chinese restaurants and, you know, are dominated maybe by them, or why don't we have a little India in, in Auckland, or why don't we celebrate the Pacific food and culture in, in a space in Auckland? I mean, they'd be fantastic things to do. Tourists would love it, locals would love it. They're not actually that hard, and they would, they would just add to the fun of, of Auckland being a place. But inevitably, if you look at the Auckland plan, by 2031, home to 1.9 million, I suspect it might be greater, let's call it 2 million, you need infrastructure. And the question ultimately comes down, councils by law can't go broke, so they're limited to what they can borrow, they have a limit to the way they can raise money, so the big issue really is that unlike central government that's got many levers to pull and can ultimately, as long as they get the appropriation through the House, essentially get, get the funds, local government has far less levers to pull. So at the moment the council said, well okay, it's a 5% rate rise and 3.5% for the next nine years. Um, will that be enough to fund the infrastructure they need, which is $31 billion, but arguably more? The answer is no. And so the question is, are they prepared to be creative? And if you want my view, um, I think a former Prime Minister that's in the room might agree with me, you could hock off the, uh, the, the port and they'd get you some cash. And then while you're at it, you might as well sell the airport shares as well. Not today, I might add, because they're not quite worth as much as they will be in a wee bit of time. But in, in reality, Aucklanders actually have to ask themselves, do they want to own those assets? Would they rather see billions of dollars picked up and invested in infrastructure that would actually support growth and livability of Auckland? Because we are notorious for building infrastructure in this city that's far too late. We build it after we need it, and it takes a decade to build it. Um, and we've got to get on with it and get a lot, lot more aggressive on that front. I, I think and it, the answer can't simply be everlasting increases in rate rises. It's not going to work. And so if you can build a more efficient city that can be home to more people, then I would say to you that that can provide revenue growth on a rates perspective, um, which is quite significant to Auckland. Last thing I would say is, um, you know, you can have the brick bats, but on the bouquets front, the changes to the unitary plan have allowed intensification of the city. Not everyone's going to love it, but I do think that it is going to both add to the housing stock, which is obviously required, and, and is actually the sensible thing to do. So we just need to keep, keep pushing all those buttons. Um, and, Sher and Sherry spoke um, earlier, and she encouraged uh, uh, Auckland to be bold, yeah. uh, I think much as you are. Uh, one of the things she said was, um, we need some place-making um, projects that help to shift the, shift the city. Do you, do you have any... Um, ideas around what you would you would see that we should be prioritising in terms of driving that sort of shift? Yeah, I mean, look, I think the waterfront and the viaduct are obvious, mm. the obvious home for that. And and you know, everyone probably thinks I'm crazy anti the poor. I'm I'm not. I just think that you know, if you sit there in life and say, if the if the Auckland planners got up this morning and said we don't have a port, should we build one down the waterfront? People would laugh them out of town. You know, I mean, we wouldn't put it there, right? What we would do is we'd transform that area into, you know, the Sydney version of, of making Auckland a world-class city. And so my view would be you've got tremendous opportunities down there. And I remember when, when the tank farm and things were being redeveloped, and I think they're actually doing a pretty darn good job, actually, down there at the viaduct. There really is an argument about whether the government would fund, you know, a world-class facility down there and lots of people talked about a Guggenheim or you know whatever it might be but there there are opportunities to use that waterfront personally um, and Helen might agree with me on this one too as well um, I'd have a stadium down downtown I know it was Trevor's idea and he's you know and people might say well you know but but real, real in reality Eden Park is in the wrong place um, it can't sustain um, what actually needs to happen there and and if, again, if you go and have a look at these world-class venues, they're surrounded by pubs and restaurants and, and, and uh, hotels, and what you do is you just use that land to develop for housing, which would be very valuable, and you could again go and, and have a world-class facility, which again, then you could have concerts to, you know, the cows come home. Not eight of them. <laughs> I'm uh, uh, conscious of time, uh, but... You yeah, were got 20 I am, 26 I seconds, I Nick, so talk quickly. Well, actually, <laughs> actually it's my show, so oh, I okay, think I might well, Take a good. bit more time. Yeah, okay, okay. Well, I'm in no rush. I'm not going anywhere That's in a good. hurry. It's good. Have you been down Key Street recently? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. We need to sort out that fun. Yeah, we do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I digress. The uh, bubble with Australia mm. and further bubbles, um, you know, one of the things I do find um, your, your insights and the, the way in which you analyse um, uh, trade and, and commerce and so on are really interesting. And I think that the, the way in which we now re-establish relationships with uh, Australia within a bubble um, in, a, in this highly cautious environment that we're, we're in, we talked earlier about maybe we should be including Singapore and Taiwan and others. I'm interested in the dynamics that are created as that relationship starts to open. And I think particularly of things like skills and the battle, someone, we talked earlier about the battle for talent. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you have a, a view on the way you see the dynamics of that playing out from today and um, you know, over, over the next sort of six months? Yeah, I mean, look, I think the first thing is the bubble's a really good step. Um, yeah, everyone accepts that you know it could have it could have stops and starts to it, but but overall it's a really positive move towards putting together what is our largest trading partner. And I think um, the reality is that you know if we accept that China is also an amazingly important you know trading relationship from our point of view, I think we have to accept that'll be a little more challenging. Um, so having movement within Australia is good. I, I personally think that there's more that we can do around the Pacific. I think that. Um, yeah, except there's a lot of COVID clearly in Fiji, but I do think those RSC workers are phenomenally good workers. They've, it's great for the Pacific communities and it's fantastic for New Zealand. And the more, even if we have to quarantine on a major scale and use some of our more public facilities, whether it's a whanua or whatever it might be, we've got to get those workers back into New Zealand. It's important for them and it's important for our country, I think. So I think it's not just solely Australia, but... But the reality is that we have, a f we have the most comprehensive trade um, and, and financing relationship with the, of, you know, really two, of any two countries in the world, and we need to tap into that. And I think increasingly, as Auckland just gets a better and better city to live in, then actually it's, it's, it's something head on competing with Sydney, because Sydney's not without its challenges. I mean, it's got tremendous infrastructure issues as well. So actually, I think we can win, we can win actually in that, that battle against Sydney, but we do have to, we have to keep those borders open if we can. Um, look, I... As much as I joked about it being my show, there are actually more important people than me that are running this thing. <laughs> and so um, I'm, I'm not going to uh, take any longer, but I would just like to, to thank you very much for uh, coming back. Um, I think that, that your presence and, and Helen Clark's presence uh, certainly give um, the, the direction that we're heading in a, a gravitas and support and your, your wisdom and experience is really valuable. So I'd like you to join with me and, and thank Sir John Thanks, for joining us. Thanks, Rex. Thank you. Thank you. So my, uh, my final task is uh, to close this hui and to um, uh, thank a few people who have been uh, instrumental in bringing this to you today. Um, I want to thank the speakers the panellists, who once again um, have provided an awful lot of thoughtful, insightful, challenging kōrero that we are now going to have to, have to um, process. We're going to have to turn it into something that's action, that's urgent, that helps to drive some, some bold action. So I want to thank all of you for having given up your time to, to provide that, that stimulus. I want to thank um, Pam Ford, Jacqueline Fullpot, the team from Auckland Unlimited, and all those that have worked to bring this uh, summit together. Um, again, it has, has been incredibly slick, apart from a couple of slack presenters who slip past time and don't follow rules. You've been incredibly, incredibly efficient and incredibly uh, effective. I also want to thank everybody here today who has come along. Um, I've been really... Um, Pleased to see how many people have lasted the full day. Uh, there, you know, the room still remains full, but then maybe that's because there's an item to come, um, which is some drinks, which I will shortly introduce Brett O'Reilly. Um, but I do want to say before I go that uh, this is um, part of a process that we learned a lot last time, uh, where we had the we had the summit. There were a lot of a lot of uh, information was generated a lot of discussion. Uh, we, we produced all of that into podcasts, into videos, 
and have processed that in various forms. We actually took it back the following morning and challenged the Prime Minister around some of the border settings that came directly out of this, out of the, the meeting last time. There were a number of actions that came out of that which continued to, to move forward now, and we wish, we're looking to do the same thing again.